what does better design for buildings uh, look like? And what specifically is design for deconstruction? Sure. So design for deconstruction is a philosophy where buildings are designed intentionally for material recovery and reuse at the end of life. So like I said, currently buildings not only have zero value at the end of life, they actually cost money to demolish and to process the waste. So instead, when we design for deconstruction, you have this fantastic ability to create buildings which, which act as these stockpiles of, of these valuable materials that can be easily taken apart and used in new buildings instead of virgin materials. And in doing that, that helps us to sort of chip away at the enormous amount of carbon emissions which are associated with the built environment. Um, and in terms, of, um, in terms of actually doing this practically, um, the deconstructed, like the ideal deconstructible building is very similar to a Lego, Lego building. Um, so we try and design components that are modular, connections that are reversible, just like Lego, um, and materials that are, are robust and reusable. And we want to try and avoid using any paints or coatings that might be difficult to remove. Um, and we want to ensure that the components of the building are easy to access and there's a plan for how they can sort of safely be removed without damaging the item. And I mean, you, you brought it, this up in your first answer, in your first answer uh, the importance of, of design, of the design stage and, you know, how much of uh, our environmental impact is determined by decisions that we made in that crucial design stage. And I mean, obviously, as you speak, it, it comes to mind that one of the benefits is probably, you know, reducing the amount of waste uh, that the built environment environment produces. Uh, but what are other uh, benefits that perhaps designing for deconstruction can have, economic or environmental, any kind of benefits? Sure. So 11% of global carbon emissions is attributed to the carbon, which is embodied in the materials that we use. So in designing for deconstruction, we are um, potentially opening up a, um, a stock of materials that can be reclaimed at the end of life and reused in new buildings, which then in turn reduces the carbon emissions associated with new buildings. Um, and in terms of um, economic, you know, in going for design for deconstruction, you know, one of the challenges that's often cited is the increased use of labour at the end of life to deconstruct, you know, in order to, to unbolt everything um, rather than just go through it with an earth mover involves a lot more people. But that is a real great opportunity for job creation, um, as is, you know, refurbishment of things that come out of existing buildings for, um, for reclamation is also a really labour intensive process that, that can create jobs in the local economy. Um, but this shouldn't stop us, right, from designing for deconstruction, as you said in the beginning. We might not have, you know, all the answers yet, but we have to start somewhere if we want to make this transformation possible. That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah, I've, I think with many things in the circular economy, you often start to uh, get almost a bit confused around the circularity of responsibilities. Um, you know, why should we design for deconstruction when there's, there's no market for it at the end? But uh, it's funny because a while back I was, I was making dinner and I got to thinking that, that someone must have invented the tin can before the tin opener. And I Googled it and, in fact, the tin opener was only brought to market some 50 years after the invention of the tin can. So the inventor designed it knowing that it was something transformational, but without having all the answers to know how it could be used. And, and like you said, Lara, you know, in terms of circular economy and design for deconstruction, we shouldn't wait to have all the answers to start doing what's in our area of influence.